Hello everyone, this is Dr. Gebrek and Labor Economics Chapter 2, Part 20. You have heard it right. It is Part 20. This is such a long chapter. All the other chapters are much shorter. Don't be scared. Um, the first chapter, couple of chapters, uh, 2 and 3, are a little bit longer, but you're going to be fine. Actually, this is the longest one. All right, Part 20. We're going to talk about labor supply over the life cycle, all right? So when I highlighted the life cycle, I am talking about just grabbing some individual stick figure person. <laughs> this is me. I don't know what these are. It looks like constantly crying emojis sideways. Uh, anyway, so how does a person behave? in their life in terms of labor supply okay so we have studied the static model so far right at one point of time this is a timeline at one point of time you know um wages change non-labor income change total time available change so how do i respond in terms of my leisure hours of work and consumption in that period of time Dynamic models are a little bit different. So this is more realistic. So you will work harder when you're younger, right? And retire at maybe 65. Although if you're born after 1960, full retirement age is now 67. So all of you folks, including myself, I was born much later than 1960. So our full retirement age is 67 in terms of social security. We will cover that in the future chapters um, in the United States. And you can still retire and get partial benefits and much lower benefits. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, we'll talk about evolutionary wage change. So this basically means wage rates change over the worker's life cycle. What we call... Uh, this generates what we call age earnings profile. So, for instance, I'm looking at my pay in the last 15 years since I graduated from grad school. There is a huge difference in terms of my earning capability. Okay, so wages are low when we are younger. Wages rise with time and peak around age 50. Right. And wages decline or remain stable after age 50. So, Changes in wages over the life cycle, right? There's these changes in wages. This is time, your life, and this is your wages. So basically, wages are uh, low when you're younger. Around 50, it peaks. 50. And then it stays, you know, constant or just goes down a little bit. Then you retire, right? So... Changes in wages over life cycle will alter price of leisure. So when the wages are low, leisure is cheaper. So I'm going to take more leisure. And when wages are high, I'm going to work more. So according to life cycle labor supply model, hours and wages should move together over time. So they're positively related over time for a particular worker. And leisure and wages should move in opposite direction, okay? So our optimal hours work um, will increase when wages are higher. And hours work will decrease when wages are lower. Is this really what we see in data? So here's the thing. It sounds like there is a conflict, right? In static model, if you remember, wages go up. It generated both income effect and substitution effect, right? Income effect says that wages go up, you're richer. Therefore, you're going to consume more of everything. Leisure, consumption goods. Therefore, you're going to reduce your hours. Substitution effect says that wages are higher. Therefore, leisure is more expensive. Run away from the good that's more expensive. So you're going to drop your leisure, increase your hours of work. This was our static model we studied, neoclassical model of labor supply. So which one is, go you know, in this model, hours and wages move the same way. So 
according to this model, substitution effect will uh, dominate when you uh, are looking at the life cycle labor supply. So static model, basically, this is theoretical, you know, issues of evolutionary wages. Static model says that changes in wages affects the budget constraint. Dynamic model, this evolutionary wage model, uh, basically says evolutionary wage doesn't change. Uh, and these changes in evolutionary wages, sorry, evolutionary rate change doesn't affect the lifetime income. So lifetime opportunity set is constant. So if you look at lifetime wages, we we anticipate wages are going to go up and stay the same, then maybe go down a little bit, right? So worker fully anticipates this weight change. So your budget line doesn't change, all right? So because of that, a person will work more hours when wages are higher. So as I said before, substitution effect will dominate the income effect and the evolutionary wage model. The profile of hours of work over life cycle. So remember, I drew that little graph, wage lifetime. Wage cycle, so your your hours of work and earnings and age profile will have the same upside down U shape. Okay, so profile of hours of work over life cycle will have the same shape as the age earnings profile. And I would like to talk about intertemporal substitution hypotheses. It says. People substitute their time over the life cycle to take advantages of changes in the price of leisure. So whenever wages are higher, I am going to work more, substitute away from leisure. This is called, I am substituting across time periods. That's what intertemporal substitution means. So this is the life cycle. Life cycle path of wages and hours of work of a typical worker. So these are ages, right? Age on the x-axis. Wage rate on the y-axis here. So wage rate, I was drawing, right? Wages go up when you're younger. Peaks at 50 stays similar, goes down. Hours of work also behaves the same way. Hours of work starts going up. We work the hardest at age 50 and then slowly going down. Let's see if actually matches with the real life data. So this, there's an evidence that both labor force participation rate and hours of work respond to evolutionary weight changes. So this is the labor force probability of working. Okay, so this is really important. Labor force participation rate over people's lives. So it shows you male is this orange one. Female is this dark uh, blue or black color, okay? So as you can see, people, men are, men and women are about 40% likely to participate in the market around age 17 or so. Both of them go up because you start making more wages, all right? Men start flattening around this age woman kind of a little bit later so male labor force participation rate peaks between 25 and 45 okay and then it's going to start going down and female labor force participation rate a little bit later peaks around 40 age 45 then after age 55 they both start declining okay but you'll still see some people working after age 65. Okay. So this is the hours of work over life cycle. So this one was labor force participation rate with four different age groups. And by the way, for really old people, <laughs> people 75 or so, it's still about 13%. So some people stay. This is hours of work. How many hours do you work in a year? Okay. So, uh, 1,600 is full-time, right? 40 weeks, a little bit more than 1,600, actually. 50. Um, this is like you only take two weeks of break. No Christmas breaks and 
it's kind of intense. But this is 2,000 hours is considered a very full time for nurses is little less, so on and so forth. So these are the hours worked. Annual hours work rises as you get older and it rises really fast around mid 20s until mid 30s. So of course this is more than full time, right? How are you how more can you stretch your hours of work? And then for men picks around age 35 45 declines after 50s 55s. So mid 50s is going to decline for women. I see it peaking around age 50s. For women, hours of work doesn't peak until early 50s. So I haven't peaked yet. <laughs> and then it's going to start declining a little bit. Okay, so next time in next part, we'll talk about labor supply over the business cycle. And we'll learn about two different very important effects, discouraged worker effects, and added worker effects. I'll see you in the next part.